Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. What do you think are some of the questions that might be asked here today? We have former governor of Georgia, uh, Jimmy Carter with us. He's running for president in 1976. I think the main thing will be energy. Energy? That's what's on everybody's mind today and that's one of the reasons I'm here today to find out about the energy situation. Good. I hope we have some good questions asked here today and I hope you go away satisfied. Hi. Hi. What do you think might be asked here today? Oh, I think I could go along with my husband, but I just am interested in keeping up with today's government, whatever the issue. Have you ever been to these meetings before? Oh, yes. You come every month? Every month. What do you think the people are going to ask him today? Uh, I think mainly the people are interested in seeing and, and speaking to some uh, presidential hope, hopefuls. And also, I think the general economy. I think a lot of people have heard and read that there's an upswing in the economy. I think they're here to find out if it's true. Uh, we're ready to start the program and the questions and answers. I hope you all enjoy the program today. And now I'll turn it over to Tony, who will introduce the congressman. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our host, Dialogue with Lytton, Congressman Jerry Litton. You know, I was talking with some friends of mine this morning. We were discussing all of the problems that we've had in politics the last uh, two or three years, discussing some of the problems of the country. And they said, Jerry, do you have any second thoughts about getting into politics now in view of the way things have gone? And I told him, I said, no, I feel a little bit like the young man that was thinking about suicide. <laughs> He'd gotten up one morning. He went into the kitchen. His wife had left a note. She'd ran off with his best friend. He went to the back door. He looked out the door, and a truck ran over his dog. He, went to the front door and someone crashed into his car. He borrowed a neighbor's car and went to town to dispose of the dog and to take care of his car. He came back at noon and his house had burned. <laughs> he went across the street to borrow the neighbor's phone and he had two or three messages. One was from his banker. His wife had taken all of his money and the other was from his doctor with a bad health report and the third from his boss. He'd been fired from his job. Uh, just one of those days. And <laughs> So he decided he was going to end it all and commit suicide. And he went to the phone book and he looked down the, the numbers of, that you're supposed to call when you think of suicide and they talk you out of it. He called them, he told them all of his problems. And they told him they'd consider the matter and call him back. <laughs> they did. They told him they decided he was doing the right thing. <laughs> I've considered the matter and I've still decided that I did the right thing. And I, One of the reasons that I, I feel that I have is because I've had the opportunity to meet and get acquainted with people such as our guest today. He and I discussed the issues last night for more than three hours. And I can tell you he's a man that not only has a very deep understanding of the issues, but he has a deep concern for how these issues affect the average American. He's a man who has a breadth of experience, and depth of experience in government. He's an innovative man. He's an articulate man. He has brought much reform to government in the state of Georgia, and I'm sure would bring much reform if elected to a high position in our federal government. He reduced the number of agencies in Georgia's government from 300 to 22. Now, if he could just streamline the federal government like that. But he's very innovative and very progressive with a lot of ideas as to what this country ought to be doing in the future. I think you're going to like him. I like him. 
He has the talent and the ability and the capability and the drive and the energy and the enthusiasm, and more important than that, the compassion that we need for the next President of the United States. Welcome, Governor Jimmy Carter. Governor, what's it like to be running for president instead of governor? It's getting better and better. <laughs> <laughs> I never have seen such, such a remarkable <clears throat> demonstration of what our nation ought to be. As to see a thousand or so people assembled here who uh, don't want anything selfish out of government, but just want to see it better, and want to participate in it, and want to make our nation again what it ought to be. And I think this is the best demonstration, Jerry, I have ever seen of uh, the kind of country that we need and the kind of country that, in my judgment, we're going to have again. So it's just great running for president, particularly running for president in Missouri, particularly running for president in Missouri, in your district. I think it's good, a good way to run for president. Not only will it teach me about this country, but it'll also let the people of this nation know me so it's a very good uh, process for learning what this country is. Although I'm a farmer, for instance, I grow certified seed peanuts. I've learned a lot more about agriculture in the last five months than I had learned in a long time in the past. I don't mean to disappoint you, but as a peanut farmer from Georgia and as, a, as me as a congressman living in Washington, let me assure you that there's more nuts in Washington than Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I can't disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so you should feel right at home. When you I do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> not, not too many are certified, I might <laughs> Mr. Carter, you said yesterday that the Ford administration has not given us any clear concepts of where the country's going. Yes. Where do you think we're going? One of the um, practical aspects of one's own life or the management of a farm, or the running of a small business, or the development of a corporation, or the management of a state, or the running of our nation, has got to be the establishment of goals that we hope to achieve in the field of mental health, physical health, uh, education, agriculture, energy, transportation, economic development, foreign trade. And right now in Washington, we have no clear concept of what this nation is working toward. What are I, we working? I happen to be a farmer, for instance, and I know how important it is for me to know ahead of time what we need to do. In the field of, um, of energy, which is going to be perhaps the most uh, important and divisive uh, new concept to present itself to the American people in the next 10 years, we have no energy policy. We need immediately to have a stop to the increase of imports of oil from other countries. Most of our plans in this country are two years, four years, and six years, a term of congressmen, senators, and presidents. <laughs> and, and, and not too many people in, in Congress look much beyond two, four, and six years, whatever their term in office might be. We do have plans uh, long-range in nature dealing with the Defense Department and some long-range plans dealing with forestry, a few exceptions, but in most cases, really, no long-range plans. And one of the biggest shocks to me as a businessman going to Congress is to find out that they weren't running our government the way I tried to run my business. They really didn't know where they were going to be five years or 10 years from now. Uh, I did introduce a bill that would establish long-range planning agency within government to take a long-range look. If we're going to run out of copper in 20 years, I'd like to know about it now and not 19 years from now when we have to spend $10 billion to do what we could do in the next uh, 20 years for much less uh, cost. But we just don't run our government that way, and I would hope that we could turn that around. Maybe the energy crisis will wake us up and cause us to run our country like a man ought to run a business. That's true. Well, one other point, uh, Jerry, if I could proceed, is that there's no way for the people of this nation to participate in government as you are today without knowing what our government proposes to do. How can you argue with something that doesn't exist? And it's very difficult for you to argue with what our future uh, agricultural policy is because you don't have the slightest idea what it is. And there's no way for us to dispute what we hope to do in the future in, say, mental health, or welfare, or education, or environmental quality, or foreign trade, unless you know what's going to happen uh, in the future. No farmer, 
Now, no businessman could, could run his business that way, and it's inconceivable to me that we continue to run the federal government in that fashion, the largest business in the world. Is this a good time to make a major sale of grains to the Soviet Union? Wouldn't it be better to build up our reserves a year or two and then make a sale? We're dealing on a world market, so a lot of people get very excited in the United States and say, gee, if we sell X number of bushel of wheat to Russia, it's going to raise the price. Well, it's going to raise the price if Russia buys wheat from any country in the world to some extent. Second thing we have to realize is very simply this. 1971, we bought two and a half billion dollars more in goods than we sold. 1972, we had a deficit in trade of seven billion dollars. The first two years, this great productive country of ours has bought more goods than it sold since 1893. 1973, we were in surplus in trade of a half a billion dollars, mostly because we increased farm exports from nine billion to 18 billion. This year, we're spending about 25, six or seven billion dollars for foreign oil that cost us five or six billion last year. Now, you can't continue to buy more goods than you sell for very long any more than you can continue to take more money out of your bank account than you put in. You're just going to have to sell something. We, we can't export labor. We're at a deficit in exporting the manufactured goods. We've got to sell what we produce in this country that's competitive enough to be on the, to be on the world market and to sell. And one of those things is food. And I think that we're going to have to look around to those who say, let's uh, embargo the export of farm commodities and ask them, all right, if we do, what are we going to sell in their place? And if there's nothing to sell in their place, how do we continue to buy more than we sell and stay economically sound as a nation? And that's a tough question. What are the chances of the American farmer of getting the view across that agriculture, as you have just stated, must be allowed to sell their products on the world market if we are to continue to have a viable agricultural system in this country. Uh, they don't put the lid on the oil companies, but they darn well put it on the American farmer. And what do you hope to get done about this situation? Because you are the most articulate voice that American agriculture has on the floor of the House and probably in the country. Jim. Jim, what I've tried to do, and, and, it, and it's hard to put your finger on it, but what I've tried to do is to convey to consumer groups and my colleagues uh, from the urban areas that when they stand up and give a speech uh, to the effect that we should embargo the export of farm commodities or any such things that would drastically drive the price of farm products down, that the net effect, the net effect is to frighten and to discourage three million American farmers the result of which is that they are less productive and they produce less. They spend less money for new and bigger and better machinery, more and finer modernization. The result is we have less food produced. And the result of their speech is the price of food to the consumers they say they're speaking for goes up. And every time they stand up and give those kind of speeches, all they do is reduce the available food supply in this country and drive the price up to the consumer. That's the story that I've been trying to get across. For too long, we've had administration leaders, even including some secretaries of agriculture, whom I won't n mention since he has been a guest of yours here in the past, <laughs> <laughs> who, who have quite often been much more interested in the, in the you know, food processes and the grain speculators and, and major grain process, uh, dealers than he has in convincing the American people that we need a productive agricultural policy in this nation that is predictable, and it also ties together the concept that the consumer and the family farmer have a mutual ultimate concern. I think this is a, a role that I can play as a candidate. And one of the best ways to make sure that this comes about, I think, of course, is to put a, a president in the White House who is a farmer. This would help a lot. <laughs> but, <laughs> I would like to agree with one thing you said. Uh, they are the, uh, the active, open, aggressive, eloquent spokesmen for agriculture are few and far between. And as a person who makes my full livelihood out of farming and my ancestors before me, I appreciate what Jerry Litton has done as a farmer himself, knowledgeable about agriculture, to let the world know and to let the Congress know and to let the American people know 
that uh, we do need a viable agricultural economy, which is the only major resource we have for rapidly increasing sales abroad, with the exception of, of arms. We can either sell weapons or we can sell food. And uh, my own preference is to increase our sales abroad of food. I, I spoke to a newspaper reporter, Governor, some time back, and he was not agreeing with the position I'd taken uh, with regard to food exports and uh, the speeches that my colleagues had given as to being uh, beneficial in driving the price of food up to the consumer. And I said, well, let's just think for a minute that you own the newspaper you're working for and uh, you're considering increasing your plant capacity and you're considering putting in new printing presses and you're considering uh, adding on to your building, you're considering bringing on more news reporters and more people to do a better job of putting out a bigger paper that will inform more people about more things. And then you hear discussion in Washington that they're considering a law that would prevent you from selling your paper further than five miles from your office and 50% of your circulation goes 30 miles away. Now, are you going to increase your plant or are you going to wait and see what the government does? And that's what farmers are doing. Why, as a young man who's deeply concerned about the future of our country, why should I go out in, in two years and, and vote for, for you, Mr. Carter? <laughs> If I can't answer that question, I don't deserve to be president. <laughs> well, I think what the country is looking for is an answer to two basic questions. One is, can the mechanism of our government work? Can it be efficient, economical? Can it uh, harness the tremendous resources of this country in an effective way, as was envisioned in years gone by and as was accomplished in years gone by? Uh, can our government be competent? The, the majority of American people think it can't. I think it can. I think when Harry Truman was in office, for instance, uh, for seven years during the Korean War, we had a balanced budget. As a matter of fact, we had an average surplus during the Korean War of $2.8 billion every year, which shows that there is a way to manage government in normal times, or even somewhat abnormal times, in a competent fashion. When I was elected governor, I went in office not as a a politician, although I don't apologize for the word, but as a farmer, businessman, an engineer, planner, a scientist, and uh, we abolished 278 state agencies and we established a simple, effective, efficient, economical structure of government that not only saved a tremendous amount of money, but also let the people understand what was going on. We passed a sunshine law to strip away the veils of secrecy that surrounded our government structure so that people could see the decision-making processes going on like you're doing here today. We put into effect a new budgeting system called zero-based budgeting, where we strip down the Georgia government each year to zero, and we start from scratch, and we reanalyze every single program that delivers services to the Georgia people. We started investing state money in banks on a competitive bid basis. We had every major department in our, in our state government that had its own computer system. Now we have one computer system. We had vast quantities of people that worked in our state government that really wanted to make beneficial suggestions about how the government could be better, but were restrained. Now they're almost forced to do it, and we have incentive rewards. The result of all this was that the people had restored their confidence in the government, and we cut administrative costs in the Georgia government more than 50% over a period of four years. The problem, one of our big problems, is we create an agency to solve the problem, and then the agency stays around long after the problem's been solved and becomes the biggest problem of all. Exactly. <laughs> I, might, I might point out. I might point out, not blaming you, Jerry, but Congress created 84 new agencies last year. It was an off, it was a bad year. Yes, an off year. <laughs> Congressman, first of all, I would like to know your analysis of the announcement by Secretary Butts last week here that he's continuing to serve as Agriculture Secretary only as a favor to the President, and at the end of 76, we'll leave. Well, I, uh, I'm glad that he said he was doing it as a favor to the President and not as a favor to the farmer. It, <laughs> and I can guarantee you he'll leave at the end of 76. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Next question. <laughs> a lot of the Republicans are claiming that the possible success of Ford in 76 would be based on economic recovery in 75. Is that recovery on its way, do you think, and will it become a back burner issue in 76? You know, this, this uh, nation ought not to let itself be fooled. I, I think one of the things that President Ford and his political advisors are doing is trying to convince the American people that a 7 or 8 percent unemployment rate is normal. And that when we get down from 9 or 10 percent back to 7 percent, that we have reached normality. Well, you know, we have the highest unemployment rate of any developed nation in the world and have been endowed with the greatest natural resources and human resources of any nation in the world. So what President Ford talks about in returning to normal has got to be accepted in this nation as an abnormality. We need to get down inside of three or four years at the longest to a two or three percent unemployment rate and to an inflation rate that's practically zero down, I'd say, in the two or three percent range. But President Ford has accepted now a projection of seven or eight percent unemployment next year as his goal. So that if he reaches a 7% unemployment rate, he's going to try to convince the American people that he's brought the country back to normal. One of the things we need to do in this country is to once again care about training people for jobs, not only to, to create new jobs, but for just training people for the jobs that exist. Uh, after our last program here, I interviewed five girls who were interested in uh, getting a job in my office in Washington as a secretary. And of the five, two were French majors, two were sociology majors, and one had majored in archaeology. None of the five had ever taken typing in college. And, you know, for a secretary, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked one of the girls that had majored in French, uh, majored in French, why she majored in French. And she said, because she liked French. And I said, well, do you ever really expect to get a job in, in, with French? She said, no, but I like French. And we have an awful lot of people who uh, go to college or whatever uh, with uh, an awful lot of time spent in academic background that really are not being prepared for a job that exists. There's an awful lot of jobs that are there that are not being filled because the people aren't trained for the jobs. And there was a time in this country we were very job oriented and people were concerned about being trained for a job. And now we seem to be interested in, in getting an education without being trained for a job. And I, I'd like to see a reverse of that. And of course the direction has to come from the federal government. And I, I think we can do something about that. I, I really believe, to, to, to have, give an optimistic, optimistic note, that that trend has already started back the other way. I feel it has. A uh, while back, there was an article in a St. Joseph newspaper about uh, you investigating the supply of jar lids to <laughs> stores in our area. Uh -huh. Do you have any further information on it? We desperately need those if we're going to preserve any fruit and vegetables for fall and winter use. You know. When we got letters, and we started to get an awful lot of letters from an awful lot of irate housewives who wrote me and they said, the president told us to put out our gardens, we put out our gardens, now we can't get lids. <laughs> and the staff said, what do we do? What kind of bills do we introduce? And I says, we don't know, we, need, we don't need bills, we need lids. You know? <laughs> so, so we started to call. Well, really, specifically to answer your question. The first problem is that we have the production and manufacture and sale of canning equipment concentrated in the hands of about three major manufacturers. And uh, they, like the few nations in OPEC, can decide precisely what they're going to sell their product for and at what price and under what condition. Now, I frankly, from what I've been able to determine, believe that we don't have a shortage of jar lids. What we have is a surplus of jars. <laughs> And the big companies will tell you that's not true. We don't have a surplus of jars. We do have a shortage of lids. And I tell them if that's true, why is it? You can't buy lids without being forced to buy the jar. And so that's why we called and called all over the United States. And we found a plant in Chicago that had been turned down by one of the big manufacturers. And we found out that they did have uh, and were producing lids. And so we're shipping them in here to North Missouri now to make them available to the various supermarkets to, to have them available to them. But let me make an additional comment along that line. I've suggested to some of the consumers in New York and Washington just this last week that the jar lid situation is a, an example of what happens when you concentrate 
the production and the manufacture and the sale of anything in the hands of a few people. Uh, something on the concern of, I think, every citizen in the country is the rapidly rising uh, violent crime rate. Uh, what can be done or what is being done on the federal level with regard to the rising crime rate? That's a difficult question to answer. I'd be glad to defer to Jerry if he has an answer to it. <laughs> I've just finished a writing, writing an article for the uh, American Bar Association monthly magazine that outlines uh, federal court reform. There are some things that can be done in our federal courts. One is to appoint judges on the basis of merit and not as political payoffs. That would help a great deal. Another thing is to have court administrators to make sure that you don't have the long delays and perpetual uh, confusion that exists in the allocation of punishment for crime. One thing I liked about the president's plan is, and, and I think we need this, is a mandatory sentence for those convicted of a crime in the possession of a firearm. And I think if we, if the people who, I think when anybody picks up a firearm and, and has it in their possession at the time of committing a crime, if they knew that if they were caught, they would face a severe and mandatory penalty, they would think twice before using the firearm. And you don't put a firearm in your hand unless you're considering the possible use of bodily harm to another human being. And I think those people ought to know that it'd be severe, and I applaud the president for that position. I think we have to keep in mind, too, that the crime rate uh, uh, has to be affected to some extent by the high unemployment. And uh, it's pretty well been indicated historically when people are out of work and when they need food, when they need help, uh, they're more inclined to, to turn to crime than they would when they've got a job. So uh, while I, I don't have a plan to cut back crime other than agreeing with what Mr. Ford said to some extent, one of the best ways to lower the crime rate is put people back to work, frankly. Governor, we appreciate your being with us, and I, I don't know about the rest of the people here, but uh, after listening to him talk, I feel a whole lot better about the future of the country. Oh, thank you. Know you. imagine you're going to have the opportunity to hear him talk a lot more between now and Election Day. And uh, those of you who can't be with us uh, next month in person, and I hope you can because we want the public to join us each month for these open meetings, but if you can't be with us in person, uh, I hope you join us on the more than 20 radio and television stations around the Midwest uh, who do carry dialogue with Lytton. So we invite you to join us next month when we again bring government to the people. Thank you. Each month, Missouri Congressman Jerry Litton invites a well-known Washington figure to come to Missouri and join him in an unrehearsed two-hour question and answer open to the public town meeting. This has been a 30-minute edited portion of this month's meeting. Dialogue with Litton is presented monthly on this station to keep you better informed about your government.